Hello, my name is Laurel Zuckerman, and today I'm going to talk to you about the challenge of false provenances. This talk will be divided into four parts. First, we'll look at a number of false provenances for a single artwork, and then we'll ask the question, what about the other provenances that were written by the same people or published in the same publications? And we'll see if we can identify patterns that might be helpful in locating artworks which have potentially problematic provenances. Before I start, I would like to tell you a little bit about myself and how I got into this kind of study. I am not an art historian by profession. What happened was in 2004, I discovered on the website of the Metropolitan Museum of Art a painting by Pablo Picasso that had once belonged to my family in Cologne. And I noticed that the provenance uh, contained a mysterious mention of a private collector. And I wanted to understand who this person was and why a mention of a private collector was in the provenance. You may have heard about Picasso's The Actor. In 2010, a woman fell into it, causing a major tear, and there was a lot of press. Also, in 2016, I sued the Metropolitan Museum of Art for its return. So in the first part, we're going to look at a number of false provenances uh, for Picasso's The Actor. But what is a provenance? It's a text that tells an ownership history of an artwork. And these texts are written at different times by different people for different reasons. So the way we're going to do this is to look at each provenance text um, separately and together in order to find the patterns. So if we break down the significant provenance texts, and um, we see a number of dates. So uh, at all of these times, something was said about the history of the painting, which was either true or it was false. So in 1912, 1921, 1929, there were things written about the actor um, in reputable sources, which gave an accurate account of, of who owned it. But from 1938, starting with a letter from Klaus Perls to Walter Chrysler, uh, there were things written about the actor, both in public catalogue raisonné, which were published, and in private letters, which were false. And in fact, from 1938, there is no more true history of the actor. So in the first years, it's simply clearly said that Paul Lefman or P. Lefman owns the actor. But after that, all kinds of other mentions enter the historical record. There's an Italian collector. There's the actor lent by Tannhauser. There's the actor uh, acquired from Volard. There's the, the actor that Paul Lefman is supposed to have sold in 1913 to a private collector. There's a Pierre Lefman who's introduced. Uh, and then in 2010, a bunch of other names are introduced. Haviland, Brumer, Feldman. So how do we analyze this? Well, I'd like to suggest that we break this false prominence into two parts. One part uh, is to look at the information about the creation of the false prominence, what one might call metadata. When was it written? Who wrote it? Who published it? Who commissioned it? What events are related to the creation of this provenance? Who is the first to cite it? Then there's a second kind of statement um, that's interesting. And those are the statements that are contained within the provenance itself, the, inside the provenance text. Uh, who does the provenance text say on the artwork? Who does it say? Uh, when does it say it was sold? Uh, what reason does it give for the sale? What sources does it cite? So it's two different approaches using this provenance text that are complementary. So if we look again 
at the timeline of this provenance text, uh, we're just going to focus on the false provenances. So we see that from 1938 to 1952, the name of Paul Lethman is simply erased from the provenance, and new names are inserted. An Italian collector, Tannhauser, uh, Vola. From 1966 to 2010, Paul Lefman's name is reintroduced, but he is said to have sold the actor in 1913 to a non-existent uh, private collector. From uh, 2010 to um, 2012, Paul Lefman is said to have sold the actor in 1913 to a private collector, and uh, there's a new owner, Frank Bertie Haviland, who is said to have been the first owner of the actor. Now, how do we know what's true and how do we know what's false? In 2012, the Metropolitan Museum of Art confirmed that Paul Lefman had in fact sold the actor in the summer of 1938. He did not sell the actor in 1913. There was no private collector. The painting did not pass through Vollard. So why, for all those years, was there a mention of a private collector? How did that happen? The private collector came from information that had been supplied by the art dealer Hugo Pearls to the curator Margaret Sollinger when she was writing a catalogue raisonné. Margaret Salinger annotated on a single special copy of the catalogue her notes from the conversation with Pearls. The Metropolitan explained that the catalogue with the annotations was discovered inside an office at the museum in 2012. And the annotation said that it was a German professor in Switzerland who had been thrown out by the Nazis, a Herr Josep Müller, who lent the actor to a Zurich exhibition in 1932, but Pearls says that he could not remember the name of the German collector. Well, all of this was false. The information private collector was then put in the catalog, the catalog of the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. There's a false provenance of the, of the actor in the second volume of John Richardson's um, much acclaimed biography of Picasso. That's where he introduces the idea that a Pierre Lefman sold the actor um, in 1912 or 1913. And there's the catalog written by and published by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 2010 on the occasion of the great uh, exhibition Picasso in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which contains a, a false provenance. So th this is interesting because these are sources that people don't question, they just cite them. And it, it's an interesting piece of information to know that they contain at least one false provenance. The fact that the provenance is false is, tells us something about the people involved in its creation. These are people who are capable of writing a false provenance. Who are the authors? And how do their stories fit together? For the Villar story, we see Rosenberg, Knudler, Chrysler Foy, and Vogue magazine, as well as the Metropolitan Museum of Art website at a certain point. 
For the private collector story, we see Hugo Pearls, Margaret Stollinger, Pierre Dex, Georges Boudai, Charles Sterling, John Richardson, the Metropolitan Museum of Art website, Gary Tintero, and Crystal Force in the 2010 catalog. For the 1913 sales story, we see the same people. What else do we know about the authors of these false provenances? Hugo Pearls is the father of Frank Pearls and Klaus Pearls, and the ex-husband of Katie Pearls, who um, was the dealer who sold the actor uh, from Paul Lefman to Hugo Pearls and Paul Rosenberg. The Pearls family, Paul Rosenberg, Chrysler Foy, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art were all owners of the actor at some time uh, in or after 1938. Margaret Sollinger, Gary Tintero, and Crystal Force were all employed by the Metropolitan Museum uh, as art historians, curators, or researchers. Pierre Dex, Charles Sterling, George Boudet, and John Richardson uh, were art historians whose scholarly work is frequently cited, and some of them are also art collectors or curators. James Sobey Thrall was an art collector, curator, and an assistant director at the MoMA. So what we do see is that we're dealing with um, very knowledgeable people uh, in the art world. Well, let's take a closer look at the pearls. They appear twice. So one of the questions we can ask is, are there any other problematic provenances in which the pearls family appears? Other than the actor? And the answer is yes. There's the Kranach, which was recently the object of a settlement with the heirs of a victim of the Holocaust. There's uh, the Chagall uh, that was the object of a claim in the groundbreaking suit uh, Menzel v. List. There's the Pissarro uh, that's disputed uh, in a lawsuit filed by Kassira, uh versus Tyson uh, where they're there's also an issue of a false provenance. And there is um, a Modigliani sculpture, which has a very amusing uh, provenance, which we won't have time to get into here. Uh, we haven't talked much about Knidler and who sold it to Chrysler Foy. The Pissarro, which is... Um, in the Kassira B. Tyson suit. There's both Pearls and Knudler in that. And there's a El Greco, which had um, quite a number of false provenances attached to it as well that went through Knudler and a number of other dealers. We'll look at one last name from the list of authors. Uh, Pierre Dex. Pierre Dex in the catalog uh, about Picasso's Blue Period, in which he gave a false provenance for the actor, um, also wrote about a number of other Picassos that had been owned by Jewish collectors. Uh, for example, Still Life with a Portrait, uh, Picasso from 1906, he wrote in the provenance that came from the collection gallery Kahnweiler and Dr. Robin Brussels, but he omitted to mention that it had been owned by Dr. Meyer Uduwald, who was murdered in the Holocaust. Likewise, in his catalog, um, he had an entry for Boy Leading a Horse, Magnificent Picasso, but he omitted to mention that it was owned by the um, 
von Mendelssohn Bartholdy family. Same problem with head of a woman and uh, Madame Soler, which the Bartholdy family, um, for which the Bartholdy family made a claim uh, against the Bavarian state museums. We don't have time in this presentation to go through all of the uh, prominence issues which have appeared. Um, however, we can say that a very rich source of false provenances is art restitution cases, the families uncovering layer after layer of false provenances. And one can perform the same exercise with these cases as we performed here with the actor, going through the different texts and seeing who the authors are and what was said. So how can we use this? How can we use the patterns and connections? We've looked a little bit at the authors of the false provenance. We have a list. We've looked a little bit at the publications containing the false provenance, both those that are published and those that are private and rather inaccessible. What about the names that we've seen that have been falsely inserted into the provenance? In this case, Italian collector, Volar, Joseph Muller, Zurich Exhibition, 1932, uh, private collector, and Pierre. One of the common threads in all of these provenances that turned out to be false was that the sources that gave the correct information were not consulted. And the new information was simply accepted as is without any verification. We've seen a number of patterns in false provenances related to Holocaust era art. The erasure of the Jewish owner, false information provided orally and not verified, the insertion of the words private collector, a curator being the first to publish the provenance to a wider public, letters between dealers who are actually business partners that provide a false provenance, the insertion of names that are completely unrelated to the real history of the painting, and the manipulation of sales dates in order to situate a sale prior to the Nazi era. How can we fight against false provenances? My proposal is a registry of false provenances that would contain the names of authors of any kind of false provenance, whether it's from a forgery, a looted antiquity, Nazi looted art, forced sales, or any other reason. The reason doesn't matter why the provenance was false. What matters is that the author created at least one false provenance, which suggests that there's a possibility that there might be more false provenances from the same author. Such a registry could help us to answer certain research questions, especially now that we have tools to analyze across large data sets of provenance texts. We can ask questions like, how many provenances with Nazi era gaps contain similar elements? How many site references that are known to contain false information, like the catalogs uh, shown in this presentation? How many contain a name 
which has previously been inserted into an ownership history. How many justify the provenances with references to private conversations or to private correspondence with dealers known to have provided false information in the past? These are the kind of questions that a registry of authors of false provenances could help us to tackle and they could bring to light other artworks for which false ownership histories have been constructed. Thank you.